sure. Continue on more for one and a half miles. So even the chlorine in our bottled water can be harmful for them, and we want to keep them safe. So that includes things like gum and candy. So if you have anything you spit out, we got a trash can right here. Uh, there are two exceptions for that. If we have an infant, we need to nurse and take a bottle. It doesn't look like we do. Uh, but if we did, we would just see Miss Becky and tell her what's happening. Or if we have a medical necessity that dictates that we need to eat something, low blood sugar, need to take a pill, anything like that, you just tell Miss Becky. She's our trail and our safety officer for today's trip. Now our second dome. There is no tobacco usage while we are down in the cave. That includes chewing, dipping, vaping, and smoking, and that includes that bus ride out of here. We are all gonna stay healthy for one hour today. Yes. All right, our third rule, our most important. If it looks like a stone, leave it alone. On our hands, we have salts, oils, and acids. Now our rocks grow when that water moves across them and the oils on our hands can waterproof them over time, preventing them from growing further. The acids and salts on our hands can discolor the rocks over time. Now millions of people have been here before you and millions of people have kind of come after you. They want to be just as beautiful as it is now for our future generations. So there's no touching our formations in our cave, but it feels and looks like a wet rock. So. We know what that feels like. <laughs> no need to worry. I will have a piece of calcite up in the beginnings and get all those touching frustrations out. All right. Uh, for some do's, ask some questions. Um, I love getting questions. This is a really good time to learn. Uh, so tell me about all of these you're curious about while we're down there. Uh, another do. Feel free to take photos. It's a beautiful cave. You're going to want those memories. However, flash will not be your friend while we're down there. So it is a 100% humidity down there. So when we use flash, it's going to refract off that water in the air and it's going to make your pictures look very hazy and they will not come out very well. But at different points, I'm going to turn on some show lights for us and that will be your best time to get those photos that you want. All right, we're going to divide two elevators, half with me, half with Miss Becky. Mm -hmm. Which one? Come on, guys. We don't like elevators. Okay. Right? You do not touch anything, and then we need to hold hands. Don't worry, I'll watch him. Okay. okay. Are you good? Ah, we're down. Hmm. I'm scared of it. So, have you guys seen this part of our cave before? We did. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. So you've seen it before, right? No, you don't have a new deal. You've been here before. I've been here. All right. Yeah. Good deal. Two weeks ago. I just couldn't stay away, right? And she was the same guy two weeks ago. All right. <laughs> she does a good job. Yeah. Gives lots of great information. So where are you guys from? If you were here just two weeks ago, local. I live here. Okay. Mountain View. Uh, just outside of Mountain View. Uh, me too. Yeah. 
<laughs> Ohio. All right. So he brought you. Yeah. Good deal. Where do you guys live? Uh, we're from uh, close to Lake Charles. Uh, Smithfield. Mm -hmm. and okay. And we're from Las Vegas. Oh, wow. Thank you. You're welcome.
All right, everyone. I want to welcome you to our cathedral room. It is the largest room in our cave. It is 1,150 feet in length. That is the size of about four football fields. So we have one football field behind us, and we have three football fields ahead of us. And that's what you're going to walk through on today's journey. We can't see all that distance right now, and that's because this room is a crescent shape. But as we go through today, we're going to traverse and have a zigzag pattern. So I want us to all imagine the Earth, but a long, long time ago, millions of years ago, in fact, when a shallow ocean laid over this section of Arkansas. And in that ocean lived many shell creatures. And over time, their shells would settle to the bottom of the ocean floor. And the weight of the ocean would crush and compact their shells to form what we call limestone. Now, when all of the mountains and plateaus of the Ozarks were then uplifted, cracks in that limestone would form. Now, water from rain would go through those cracks, through the forest floor, down through the rock, and it would pick up carbon. It would become what we call carbonic acid. Now, carbonic acid exists in soda, so it gives soda that kind of fizzy quality. But that carbonic acid would, over time, wear away and dissolve the rocks. And it would hollow out big sections under the mountain. So that is how the caves in the Ozarks were formed. So our cave was somewhere between 50 and 70 million years old. But then that water would still continue to come in when that rain would fall. We can actually hear a lot of water coming down today. When that water would come in, it would carry more sediment with it. It would deposit that sediment over the course of many more millions of years to create all these gorgeous formations that we see behind us. So I'm going to give you all a three-question pop quiz about our cave. Now it's group answer, so if you know it, you can just shout it out. And the stakes are pretty high, because if you get all those answers right, I will let you leave the cave today. Yes. All right. Do we know what this formation is called up here? The lactite. The lactite. That is right. As a C in it for ceiling, and it hangs tight. Mm -hmm. What about this one? That's right, it's a stalagmite. as a G in it for ground, and it might reach the ceiling. What about this one? Oh. A column, that is right. You guys all get to leave the cave today. <laughs> we have a formation over here. This is called a slow stone. So it forms when that water comes across it in very thin sheets, like a thin waterfall over time, creating that. Mm -hmm. So earlier I told you that you actually get to touch calcite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is what all of the formations in our cave are made of. Calcite is a six-sided crystal. It's pretty heavy. It's about three times the weight of water by volume. And when it is pure, it is a sparkling white. So we can pass this around. You can see that calcite has this beautiful... Look, Alex. That's one of them. Oh, it's rough. When we're done healing those, we can just put them behind us, and we'll collect them at the end. So our cave, we like to think about it having three stories. But if it was a house, it wouldn't be completely up. It's a split-level house. They're not all perfectly stacked on top of each other. But we're in that top layer of the house, in the attic. So even though our cave has those three stories, and this is the top layer and the oldest layer, it was the last one to be discovered. And that's because the only way into this cave naturally is through a sinkhole in the valley that deposits into the middle layer that's down below us. So in the 1950s and 60s, a lot of explorers were mapping out caves here in the Ozarks for the civil defense because they're trying to find fallout shelters because we are in the height of the Cold War. Now, when this cave was found, you could see that it was very big, and they thought at first it would be a good fallout shelter. But we can look and see these right here. These are called cave curtains. We can see that they are curved and curled in at their tips. Now, they are curved like that because this cave has really excellent airflow. All of the air in here is replaced every 24 to 48 hours, so that radiation would be sucked in through here almost immediately. So they knew that would not be a good fallout shelter. 
But in 1963, that group of explorers had brought a couple of 17-year-old boys with them, and they sent them up to do a very dangerous climb. Do we see how tall this wall is? That wall is 60 feet tall. To enter this room, in the layer that is down below us that they mapped out first, you have to scale a 100 foot wall. So that's 60 feet, so we can imagine 40 feet more on top of that. How difficult that would be. But it was done in 1963 by those two 17-year-olds that they had brought with them. Their names were Mike Hill and Robert Stanford. Now we're going to see blue lights throughout our journey today.
So once the lab mites grow, they grow that water is moving very quickly, quick enough to pull that sediment and splash it down on the bottom. A stalactite grows when the water is moving very, very slowly, slow enough for it to dry up there at the top. So our column became a column right here. You can see where they have jointed up together. Well, you know from the vast majority of its life that its water was moving very quickly, coming down. So all the water that feeds all of these formations right here are mostly coming from right here. We see this ribbon of stalactites. That is called a major joint. It's where two sections of rock have came and met each other like this. That is a naturally weak spot for water to be able to pass through. And water is what makes all of these grow. So that water coming in has fed this area especially well, which is why we see so many wonderful formations right here in that section. Now earlier I told you that all of this is made of calcite and that calcite is pure white. But we're looking at this and we see that it isn't pure white. We see all these beautiful oranges and tans on our rocks. And that's because calcite is a bit of a bully. It's a crystal. It's very stable. It does not want to bond to anything else but itself. So when another mineral interacts with it, calcite pushes it right through the outside edges of it. So underneath, if we were to scrape off this very outermost layer underneath, it would be that sparkling white. So all of these reds and oranges and pins we see in our cave, that is iron oxide that is staining our rocks. And when we see colors like gray and black and kind of greenish tones, that is manganese dioxide that is staining our rock. Please don't stand on that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, but underneath it is that sparkling white. So in a little ways, we're going to see on this wall, we're going to see some of that beautiful outside in our journey. Now, does anybody have any questions? I already took pictures earlier. All right. Do we see this fun texture here? Oh. See this fun texture here on the wall? We have some over there behind us. What does this remind us of? Does anybody see some shapes in there? Popcorn. popcorn. That is right. This is called cave popcorn. Also called cave coral. Or by my personal favorite name, Caver's Nightmare. Although it might not look it, it is incredibly sharp. So sharp that our early explorers would see it and would fill them with dread because it could cut through their leather climbing gloves they were using. Yeah, so it makes traversing this area very dangerous and very difficult. This area is dangerous. Oh, extremely sharp. And you have to a band aid, you're telling on yourself. Now, Cave okay, Coral, our geologist thinks, grows one of two ways. So the first competing theory, it grows when water clings to it in the form of mist. So we can think about in our shower how that water will heat up on the wall, just like that over here. Or it grows through hydrostatic pressure. Now we also use a sponge before. We know that water gets shot out to the outside edge. So this rock has a lot of pressure above it because there's so much weight on top of that. And that causes kind of a squeezing motion and it pushes any water that could have been trapped between its layers to the outside. So that was our competing ideas of how cave coral forms. But the real answer is that we're not quite sure yet. So there's still lots of mysteries in geology that we can still discover. And I think that is wonderful. There's always more to learn. All right. Any more questions? How that form? How that form? Yes. So water came in from the ceiling. And over time, it carried lots and lots of tiny sediment. So it's like if you had a tiny little fleck of rock, it dropped it, and then over time, they dried and fused together and created that. Right? That's how all of this was made. Very, very slowly, though. Okay. All right. We're going to keep moving. We're going to see that really pretty calcite.
So nobody stands in the steep incline. So in this layer of the cave we are in, no natural light ever reaches it. So without all of these artificial lights being put in, it would be darker than the void of space in here. We can imagine just that deep darkness. So in the 1960s, when we wanted to develop this tour, we knew that lighting was going to be a very critical endeavor for us. So we hired one man to do all of our lighting for us, and his name was Miroslav Blue. He was an immigrant from a country formerly known as Czechoslovakia in Europe, and Miroslav considered himself an artist with lights. In, in his career, he worked lighting opera houses and theaters primarily all across the world. In the U.S., he had done the lights for the Met Opera House and the Kennedy Center. When we approached him about doing our cave, he was very excited. It was going to be the very first cave he had ever done, and he thought he could do it all in six months. So then, after 18 months on the project, he decided this would be the very last cave he would do. <laughs> but this was Miroslav's favorite section of the cave. He worked on those opera houses earlier, and he thought this looked like an opera box. Um. We can imagine the ornate curtains, the balcony, even a big column. And we have a little calcite audience looking at us. Now, if we look over here, we see some rope columns. That's what these really thin ones are called. This one is 16 feet, and this one is 18 feet. They are about the diameter of the handrails we are using. Now, has anybody ever grabbed an icicle before? Do we know how easy icicles snap when we grab them? Just as easily as I could snap an icicle, we could snap one of those. Now, Kausa is a heavy rock, but it's a very soft rock. On the Mohs hardness scale, with chalk being a 1 at the softest and a diamond being a 10 at the hardest, calcite is only a 3. Our fingernails are 2.5. It's not that much tougher than we are. But those up there are thousands of years old. So they tell us that earthquakes cannot reach us down here. Because if they could, the vibrations from those earthquakes would shatter those very delicate formations. So when an earthquake happens, the epicenter of it, the center, sends off S waves. S waves are what actually shakes the ground. They only shake the ground 90 feet deep. But as we are standing right now, we are about 220 feet deep. So earthquakes cannot reach us. Earthquakes have happened while people are down here, and what happens is it sounds like rolling thunder above you, but nothing in here shakes or vibrates at all. But I saw people who doubt that we're safe from earthquakes. So up here, we have a seismic sensor. Now if any vibrations were, reading, were making its way down here, it would go off, it would descend from the ceiling, and it would alert us immediately. But it's been up there for 51 years, and we've never heard anything out of it. So we know that we are very safe from seismic activity. Now does anybody see any shapes in that formation over there? Battleship, that is right. This is our USS Battleship. It's one of our few named formations we actually have here in the caves. Just as we need something to do all of our lights, 
We had something to do all of our trails and rails and rock ledges. Now the men that we hired to do that for us, a lot of them were U.S. veterans. They were veterans of World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. And when they were working down here, they would look up there, and they would say it looked a lot like the battleships that they toured on. Now to do all of this construction was very difficult work. They could not use very many electrical machinery at all because the vibrations from it would destroy our delicate formations. So instead, they had concrete carried it around five gallon buckets and used wheelbarrows. And that's how they did all of this, all by hand. All of the rock ledges that we see were taken from rubble out here and then formed to make all of this. These were all hand picked. That took them eight years to complete. That was a lot of very difficult work. So we kept the name that they had given it to honor them for making this tour possible for us. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, we are going to move on to our next step. You can see that these rails are actually bent in to protect this from that shark cave coral. So instead of building that stairway up, we instead built a tunnel through the mountain. So this tunnel that we're about to go through is entirely man-made. So when we go through it, we're going to stay on that right side of the railing, and then we're going to stop about halfway through, we see a silver door, and I'm going to talk about how we built that tunnel safely. No. Come here, you have to climb. Last 
Mana yang salah tuan? except for one. This one right here is 51 years of new calcite growth. So even in this tunnel, we have new formations coming in. So we can just really appreciate by how little has grown from those 51 years, how ancient everything else in this cave must be. All right. We're going to continue onward now.
the coral room from all that cave coral we've been seeing. But I do like to imagine that this section out ahead of us looks a lot like a coral reef with these stalactites. And just as a coral reef is very biodiverse, so is our cave. Our cave is home to 123 different species. We have four species that live here and nowhere else on our earth. That is a species of slime mold, spider, beetle, and my personal favorite, the pseudoscorpion. Yes. We also have five species of salamander that make their home down here. We have the cave salamander, the Ozark blind, the black slimy, the dark sided, and the zigzag salamander. Now our cave salamander, he is our apex predator. He is the top of the food chain. So he is red, it's about six inches, he's got all those black spots along his back. Yes, so even though he's very small, he is the top predator who hunts inside the cave. But we have another species who lives here, but they don't hunt inside the cave, and that is our bats. Now, we have four species of bats who live here. We have the gray bat, the big brown, the tricolor, and the Indiana bat. The majority of our bats Oh, do we see a few flying? They might be coming through here. The majority of our bats are out in the forest right now and they are forming maternity colonies. Because not that long ago, our bats had their pups. When bats have pups, they only have one a year. They can have twins, but it is pretty rare. So we still have 20,000 bats who are still currently residing in the cave. They are in that layer that's down below us, and that's because they need to be by that natural entrance. Because they have to exit through it and come back every night to hunt. So the 20,000 bats are still hanging down here. They are bachelor bats. They are single males who do not have a mate, or we have a couple of females who do not have pups this year. So they go in and out every night to hunt, and when our bats hunt, they eat between 1,000 and 3,000 flying insects every single night. That is amazing, especially given that their body is about the size of your thumb, and the wingspan is about the size of a dollar. They are micro bats, our gray bats, and they make up 80% of our bat colony. So those bats do such wonderful things for us by eating all of those moths and mosquitoes. Now we probably see a couple of these guano piles walking through the cave today. That's our, what those are, recycled mosquitoes. <laughs> they are historical, they are not fresh. We have a really large one over here. This one is 30 feet long, it is about six feet tall. 
Now bats will return to the same place generationally with their rocks above those guano piles that they have left. And that's how they know it's a safe place to return to. So all of these guano piles are the culmination of many generations of bats. But we don't see them up here right now. They don't live on this layer so much anymore. Now we didn't chase them off. Around 200 years ago, an event happened that collapsed one of the entrances back here. So if we look behind us, we can see that there used to be a sinkhole right there that the bats can come in through and exit from. But we carbon dated the top of this guano pile over here and found that's 200 years old. And that indicates that this collapse probably happened around 200 years ago. Now it could have just been from erosion, that is the most likely culprit. Uh, could have been a lot of flooding that moved things in. It could have been the New Madrid earthquake that happened in 1811, destabilizing the surface, causing a little landslide. But we don't actually know what caused it for sure. Well, that did collapse off those bats. Natural exit on this layer. So that is why these guano piles are historical and don't have that smell that we'd associate with guano because they are not fresh. So, bats do so many wonderful things for us. They eat all of those insects, but in other parts of the world, they are vital pollinators. So if we like bananas, agave, avocado, mango, chocolate, we should thank bats because they are the main pollinators for all of those wonderful crops that we enjoy. Now, there's a big problem that our bats are facing in North America. It's called white nose syndrome. Has anyone heard of it? Okay, so white nose syndrome is a fungal disease. It came over from Europe on accident in 2006. It hitched a ride on a cargo ship and it landed in New York. From New York, it started to spread across the US. As of 2024, it has reached the West Coast. That is coast to coast bat infection. In our Northern states, they have lost 90 to 100% of their bats from it. That's because that fungus grows really well in those colder climates. But our cave is considered a warm cave, so it's too warm for that fungus to thrive in here, but it is present still. We've only lost a couple hundred bats because it cannot get a good foothold due to the temperature of our cave, but we don't want to spread it anywhere. So what white nose syndrome does is it makes our bats very itchy and very dehydrated, and that's a big problem because they wake up from the itching in the winter and they think it's time to go hunt, but then there's no food and it's too cold for them. So we don't want to spread this fungus anywhere else because it reached us in 2014. So we're all on vacation right now or we've traveled in from close by. Either or, we don't want to bring it back to wherever it is our home is from. So that fungus is probably got a couple of those spores on the bottom of our shoes. Sunlight will kill what's on our skin. When we wash our clothing, that'll kill that. We don't often think about washing our shoes. So we leave today, we'll see some very big black mats. On the ex when we're exiting our bus towards the visitor center. What these mats have in them is a solution of soap, woolite, and water. What woolite will do, it'll take any fungal spores that are trapped to the bottom of our shoes and it'll puncture them. So then the contents of that cell spills out and it cannot replicate. Because there is no current cure to white nose syndrome, the best thing we can do right now is our prevention efforts. So we're going to be across our mats to save our bats. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, then we are going to see the next section.
stalactite nursery them at the very beginning of their life so all of our big stalactites all at one point look a lot like this so in this phase they're actually hollow like real soda straws are and that water can move through them pretty freely we can see all of these drips happening back here now eventually their tips will clog and then they'll widen out this carrot shape we associate with stalactites but if they cannot widen out, eventually the water pressure in them will build and build until the tips of them are then broken off from that pressure, and they will have to begin that growth cycle all over again. So we are at the point in our journey where it's a really good spot to get photos of you and your loved ones. And if you would like those photos, I would love to help you. You're going to want to turn on your flash because you are exceptionally well backlit in this area of the cave. I got dripped on. That is a cave kiss if you've got dripped on, and that's lucky. Good luck. Yeah. Oh, we got to find the water yeah, I've been dripped on every right, so few what, times. What are we gonna I got dripped on. Right. Oh, right. Right. Oh, right. Right. Oh, 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 Okay, here. Yeah. 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 He wasn't smiling. All right, we got a smile. <laughs> All wonderful. Right. Yeah. It's my pleasure. All right, let's get that next family on up. Thank you. 
All right, everyone. As we're getting those last minute photos, I just have one last announcement to make. We are the USDA Forestry Service. We are not the US Parks Department. Because we are the Forestry Service, we have a zero dollar advertising budget. So if you enjoyed this tour, please tell all the folks that you know, all of your loved ones, and please come back. You guys are our best advertisers through word of mouth. And you guys have been a wonderful tour group. I've loved having you. So Miss Becky, she is gonna lead us out of this cave and she's gonna take us to a bus that'll drive us back to the visitor center. Okay, y'all come. Come. Mm -hmm. Do you want to miss this? Thank you. Okay, bro, they're gonna they're gonna make one of this. Goodbye. Okay, so she's gonna hold me to the top of that look. Mm -hmm. Wala lagi gitu dan ini nak kata anak kita ke badul. Bro enjoy mang hapun. Okey mang hapun. Y'all, come on. Come on.
many north of that, but most of it was from Quentin South. Now we occasionally have one that might be like a 2.7 or a 3.1. I'm sorry. The one right there. Oh, dear. Yeah. 